Rawhide Adventures is a company that teaches people how to ride big adventure touring motorcycles off-road. Um, we manage um, motorcycles that are, that are designed for long range travel for on or off-road riding. And we have a 500 acre ranch in California. Um, people come to our school um, oftentimes with very little or no off-road riding knowledge. And, uh, and over the course of several days, we teach them the nuances of off-road motorcycle riding, things like balance and clutch control and, and uh, how to use the throttle properly, um, how to um, felicitate, fel felicitate good body position, and moving on up to things like hill climbs and descents and, and riding through trees and sand and mud and just about everything you could expect to find in the real world we have on our facility. Today, uh, we have got a group together from a local dealer here in Colorado, and we're teaching people how to ride motorcycles off-road. Um, the people here today, um, most of them have never been off-road or have very little experience riding motorcycles in the dirt, and, and uh, they've been convinced that it would be a good use of their time to come out and spend a few hours learning some off-road riding nuances. Um, How's it going? Ready to learn how to ride off-road? Yes. yes. Excited? Yes, yes. please. You nervous? Yes. Petrified. Yes, no, <laughs> yeah. Um, Folks, I think that we uh, may have had an opportunity to uh, introduce ourselves to you, um, but if we have not, um, I'm Sean. I work for Rawhide. This is my brother, Lance, and we're here to teach you how to ride motorcycles off-road. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I want to give you an idea of how the day is going to go down. Um, we're going to start the morning talking about the mistakes that people make when they take motorcycles off-road. Um, we're going to conduct inspections on everybody's bikes to make sure that they're ready for the day. Um, we're going to conduct drills today on low speed handling, uh, balance control, braking drills, turning drills, and we're going to talk about the kind of gear and equipment that you need on your motorcycle if you're going to take it off-road. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Before we get into that, um, a little bit about us and Rawhide. Um, we are here because BMW wants more of you taking their motorcycles off-road. They That's want to sell parts. <laughs> <laughs> they want to sell parts. Exactly. Well, <laughs> um, the, uh, the GS, in Lance and I's opinion, is, is the most capable motorcycle ever built. And uh, however, riding this motorcycle off-road um, can be daunting. Um, and, and we want to turn that around. So um, the goal here is, is to make you feel comfortable and confident taking your motorcycle off-road. BMW feels that if you enjoy this motorcycle off-road the way it's intended, then you will be very loyal to their product. And well, they're probably right. Um, that being said, um, I started riding off-road um, in t about June of 2003, and I stopped riding off-road about a week later. Um, I, <laughs> I uh, was really excited about the idea of riding off-road, but what I very quickly found when I rode off-road is that the bike handled in ways that it did not handle on the asphalt. And when I tried to apply street riding technique in the dirt, it did not work. And I ended up on my side uh, many, many times, more times than I'm going to admit to you. Um, the short of it was is that uh, I, I discovered very quickly that off-road wasn't for me. I had never been in the dirt in my life, and uh, taking one of these big machines off-road was just intimidating, in a word. Um, so I was a street bike rider, and that's fine. Um, these are great street bikes. Um, not long after that went down, I was introduced to Jim Hyde, um, who had just started Rawhide Adventures, and he explained to me that what I went through was very, very common, and that people uh, fell down on these bikes all the time because I didn't have proper training. And he convinced me to come to his school and spend two days there learning how to ride off-road. And I did, and I fell in love with this sport. Um, I started looking for dirt instead of avoiding it. Um, I started becoming an evangelist for adventure riding and eventually was given the opportunity to be a trainer at Rawhide, and as you might imagine, I jumped on it, and here I am. Um, that being said, my brother Lance has a, a, a much better story. Lance? Thanks, Sean. Uh, my story started about four years ago with a call from Sean. He was uh, bringing a bunch of guys down to Rawhide. We live about it's about a five hour drive to Rawhide and he asked me if I would drive the truck down with all their gear and he said if you do that I'll set it up so you can take the class for free and believe it or not I turned him down <laughs> back then I just I was not interested in motorcycles I you know I and I thought I'm gonna be I'm gonna spend a whole weekend and have nothing to say to anybody you know how it is when you get into something new and he kept twisting my arm so Friday afternoon I found myself driving down to Rawhide um, just not looking forward to the weekend at all and um, I, they put me on one of these for two days, and I was like hooked. Um, a couple weeks later, I went out and bought one, um, took all my camping gear, put it on the back, went up to the Sierras, and spent months just riding around on every dirt road I could find, and I was just having the time of my life. 
and uh, I got myself in all kinds of trouble and I scared myself quite a few times but I was just it was just the coolest thing ever and uh, so that led to me um, helping out at Rawhide at big events and um, and then that I started driving the support truck for Rawhide and then that led to being an assistant trainer and um, um, then Sean and I ended up leading well the toughest ride that we do at Rawhide and, um, and now I'm here with Sean helping people get the most out of these bikes because I think they're very capable off-road bikes and um, there's a lot of misconceptions about these bikes and we're here to kind of set all that straight so thank you all for showing up today y'all might be interested to know exactly how many years of experience Lance had when he took the Rawhide course I had a full two hours riding experience when I showed up at Rawhide. And they put me on one of these and um, I was, I have to admit, I was intimidated. I mean, it felt heavy to me and uh, I just, but by the end of the weekend, like I said, I was hooked. It just, the, it the whole feel thing heavy just, anymore. Huh? It doesn't feel It heavy. doesn't, believe it or not. I mean, even the adventure doesn't feel heavy to me anymore, so. Um, anyway. Lance promptly went out and bought himself a bike and put 30,000 off-road miles on it the first year. Wow. Wow. A lot of it alone. I was up in the Sierras taking, and as much as I learned at Rawhide, there was still a lot more to learn, and a lot of it I learned the hard way. <laughs> so uh, I, I dropped this bike in, the, not this particular one, but the one I own, in a river way up in the Sierras. I was way out in the back. Nobody knew where I was at. It was getting dark. It was all I could do to get the bike picked up. I was, you know, you can imagine how cold mm -hmm. the waters, and I was freezing. I had to build a big fire just to keep from freezing at night. But again, I was just having the time of my life. I just love the whole adventure part of these bikes. So, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, Lance is now um, our advanced instructor when we're not traveling around the country, um, running what we do for you. Um, um, you, um, standing before us today, constitute number 56 of 60 clinics that we will have done over the course of two years. Uh, we've trained almost 2,000 people how to do what you're gonna learn to do today. Um, today is a day of education. Um, we want you to understand the fundamental elements of taking a motorcycle off-road. Um, we, as, as intimidated as you may be today, please rest assured on a couple things. Um, we will not ask you to do anything we don't think you can do. Um, we will not get you out of first gear all day. <laughs> um, the best way to learn how to ride is to ride slow. Um, um, you will be challenged and you will leave a better rider than you arrived. Um, that being said, we would like to talk about the top mistakes that people make when they take a motorcycle off-road. These are the kind of things that we're going to try to work on with you today to make you feel a little more comfortable and confident riding your motorcycle off-road. So Lance here is going to be my guinea pig and he's going to help us determine some of the mistakes that people make when they ride off-road. Okay, so the number one mistake people make when they ride a motorcycle off-road. Can anybody tell me what Lance is doing wrong here? Sitting. 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 Yes, he's on a center stand. Very good. <laughs> um, when you ride a motorcycle off-road, they move in ways they do not move on the asphalt, and you need to be able to manage that movement. Managing it comes from balance, and balance comes from your feet. Your feet know a lot more about balance than the rest of your bodies do, especially your rear end, which is where you're balancing when you're sitting down. So when you're riding off-road, it's very important that you stand up all the way up so that your knees are almost locked. This is a proper riding stance for taking a motorcycle off-road. Now pay close attention to something here. Notice how much hand Lance has got on his grips. Notice he's using the tips of his fingers. Do you think Lance has reasonable control of his motorcycle with the tips of his fingers? Probably not. That's a hard way to control a bike. Notice what happens when Lance reaches down to grab a hold of his lever. See how his upper body has now moved forward? When we're riding a motorcycle off-road, it's very important that we do not use the handlebars to hold us on the motorcycle. The bars have a natural flow and sway to them, and you need to allow that to happen. When you're reaching down like this, you're holding onto the bars and you choke the bike from its natural flow and sway. Now, but when Lance is standing up properly the way he's supposed to, he doesn't have enough control of his levers to actuate the bike. Now, is there anything you think we can do to this motorcycle to make it more comfortable for Lance? Aha! Uh -huh. Bar risers, very, very good. A bar riser is a really good idea for Lance. He's a tall guy, and he doesn't have an easy reach to his bars. So putting a set of bar risers on this bike would make him a lot more comfortable. Doing things like rocking the handlebars up, which we've already done, will make the bars sit closer to his hands so he doesn't have to reach so far to grab them. Other things like adjusting the levers, adjusting the foot pegs, all of which are typically um, available to do on your motorcycle. However, most of us never do it because we don't know any better. 
Today, during our inspection, we're gonna have you stand up on your bike just like Lance's, and we're gonna watch how you stand on your bike. We're gonna make suggestions for improvement, some of which we can do right on site, others of which you can go over to BMW in Denver and pick up, like bar risers and foot pegs and that sort of thing. The goal is always to make you more comfortable on your motorcycle, both standing and sitting. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Good. Now, the number two mistake that people make when they ride a motorcycle off-road. Anybody tell me what Lance is doing wrong here? Looking down. Aha, uh -huh, yes. People that ride off-road are fascinated with their front tires. <laughs> like staring at those. I want to make sure it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a couple reasons why this is not a good idea, and one of them is very obvious. When you're looking down, you can't see what's coming. You're going to end up running over obstacles that you could have easily avoided if you would have looked ahead and saw them coming. But when you're looking down at your tire, you can't see them until you're right on top of them. You have very little time to react. The other disadvantage to looking down, when you're riding a motorcycle off-road during our clinic, we're going to ask you to use your clutch and your throttle and your brakes in ways that you have probably never used them before. And people that are learning to, new, to do new things tend to watch themselves learn. So as you're actuating your clutch and your throttle, you're going to be doing this. Now the problem with that is that your body has an impeccable sense of balance. Just standing here watching us talk today, you're making all kinds of little minute movements to keep yourself upright and balanced, and you're not even aware you're doing it. The same applies when you're on a motorcycle. However, when you look down and you stare at your hands, your eyes try to override your body's sense of balance. It starts to micromanage the, your balance, and it's not very good at it. A good analogy is walking down your hallway with a full cup of coffee. What happens when you stare at the cup? goes all over the place. If you look where you want to go, you might spill a drop or two, but you usually get from A to B just fine. Experienced waitresses and servers at restaurants will carry three cups of piping hot coffee in their hands. They don't spill a drop because they're looking where they want to go. We're going to test your ability to look where you want to go during our exercises. At the start gate of our training course, Lance is going to have you focus on a point on the other side of the trail, and I am going to try to distract you. I'm going to get in front of you and wave my hand in your face and shimmy your bike and do whatever I can do to get you to look at me. If you look at me, you will put your feet down. If you keep looking where you want to go, you'll usually be fine. It is not okay to run over me. <laughs> as much as he says it is. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> now, the number three mistake that people make when they ride a motorcycle off-road. Anybody tell me what Lance is doing wrong here? No, he's too stiff on. Aha, very good. He's very, very tense. Notice how the veins in his neck are starting to pop out and his, his shoulders are into his ears. People that ride off-road are much, much too tense. They need to loosen up and relax. We're going to work today on getting you to relax. Now, when you're tense like this, you get to run into all sorts of trouble. Say you were to hit an obstruction in the road, uh, a log, for example. What's going to happen is as you're rolling forward and you hit that log, the shock of the impact is going to hit the tire go up through the fork tubes into the handlebars, and if you're tense, it's going to go into your upper body. I'm going to kick Lance's tire. We're going to pretend like it's a log. Pay attention to what happens to his upper body. Ready? Yep. See where you went there? One more time. Now, what do you think is going to happen next? He's going, he's going down. Luckily, this is all pretty soft, so it won't be so bad. But if you stay relaxed and you allow the bike to flow and sway, then basic physics comes into play. An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. If you're riding along and you hit something, usually the wheel spin of the tires will straighten the bike out for you without you having to do anything. So if you stay relaxed and limber and you hit that same log, ready? Yep. See what happens there? It's very important that you stay loose and relaxed. This will help you to absorb impacts. As we're riding today, you're going to hear us many, many times saying, you got a lot of tension in your upper body, relax. Got a lot of tension in your arms, soften that belly. <laughs> All right, the next mistake that people tend to make when they ride a motorcycle off road. Anybody tell me what Lance is doing wrong here? Stop his elbow. Speed. Thank you. We've had a hard time coming up with a good analogy for speed when he's sitting still. People that ride off road ride way too fast. And there's pretty good reasons for that. When you're riding a motorcycle off-road, there's a lot of slip and sway to the wheels. You feel the tires slip in the dirt. However, when you get them spinning really good and fast, that starts to go away. The centrifugal and gyroscopic effect of the wheels locks it into the terrain. It makes it feel a lot more like riding on asphalt. It feels more familiar. However, when you go to grab a hold of the brakes or turn the motorcycle, that gets blown all to hell. Because bikes don't stop and turn in the dirt the way they do on the asphalt. 
It's very important that you learn to ride the motorcycle slow, very, very slow, slower than you could go in first gear with the clutch out. During your very first exercise, we're gonna have you ride this bike as slow as you can possibly go. In fact, I'm gonna walk next to you and your goal is not to pass me. So as I'm walking along, you're gonna try not to get past me as I walk next to you on your bike. And then we'll be giving you pointers on how to look where you wanna go and stay relaxed and that sort of thing. The goal all being to help you understand what, how to balance your motorcycle properly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The last mistake that people make when they ride a motorcycle off-road is in regards to turning a motorcycle. It feels really good to turn a motorcycle on the asphalt, especially when you do it right and you get your weight to the inside and drag your knee and look through the turn, and get the motorcycle on the side. I can't say that I can do that, but it does look really cool to me. When you ride a motorcycle off-road, we do not do that. We will never ask you to put your weight on the inside of the motorcycle like you do on the asphalt. We will ask you to put your weight to the outside of the motorcycle. Lance is gonna demonstrate for us here and give us some examples on why that's a good idea. Lance? All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, if I was gonna make a right hand turn, is reposition my left foot. That's the foot I'm gonna put my weight on. And I'm gonna, and I'm, as I make the turn, I'm gonna put my weight to the outside of the turn, which is exactly opposite of what we've learned on street riding. Typically on street riding, we're getting our weight to the inside of the turn, but on loose ground and, you know, um, uh, sand. We want to lean the bike into the turn and the only way we can do that at slow speed is to use our body as a counterweight. Um, and and what, ha what we see a lot in these clinics is um, people riding on their arch and trying to pivot with their, with their weight on their arch. So the first thing you want to do is take your foot, get out on the ball of your foot or the, even the toes of your foot and see how far I've turned it in. That makes it really easy for me to transition to this position. Okay? Um, I'll demonstrate on the right side for you guys. Turn your foot in. You see that a left turn's coming up. The first thing you do is reposition your outside foot. That's what all your weight's gonna be on. And then look into your turn and um, <coughs> shift your weight to the outside of the turn. All right? And we're gonna talk about that later. We just kinda wanna get you thinking about it now. That's gonna be the last drill we're gonna work on. And we'll kinda go over all this um, just before we start the, the last drill. Cool. All right. There's a couple of reasons that we do this. As Lance mentioned, we use our weight as a fulcrum against the weight of the motorcycle. The farther we can get our weight to the outside of the bike, the slower and tighter we can turn the motorcycle. The other advantage is in regards to traction. Again, as Lance said, the tires have very, very little traction. When you're turning a motorcycle in the dirt, if your weight is on the inside, your weight will push against the tires in such a way to where they wanna slip out from underneath you. And once they start slipping, they will not stop until you're on the ground. By shifting your weight to the outside of the motorcycle, you're able to transfer the traction point of the tire to a much more stable location. It makes it a lot less likely to slip. We're going to spend more time on turning drills than we do on any other drill, because it takes a little time to figure out. It doesn't feel right taking your toe and twisting it around on the motorcycle, but once you understand it, it's, it's a major benefit to you. Lance, can you show them what parts of your body are holding you on the motorcycle? So if I'm making a left turn, I've, I've repositioned my right foot, I put my weight on it, now what I'm doing is I put my knee into the tank or into the seat there. That's what's holding me on. I'm not using my bars. The big mistake that we see a lot is people hanging on the bars. If, if you hit a rock or slip, you can't recover if, if, you, if you're using the bars to hold you on. So really the only thing that's holding me on is my foot and my knee. The inside of this leg is holding me on just a little bit. But once you get kind of the gist of the idea of using your knee into the tank, to support you, it opens up a whole new world of riding these bikes off-road. Uh, the, other, the other advantage to that is, if you do have the front end of the bike wash out, um, it's an easy to step off the bike. Um, if, you, if you've got your weight to the inside and the, and the bike washes out, then you can't get your weight off because that's supporting you. Typically the, ball, the bike falls on you with your leg underneath it. It's, it's really easy to step off when you're making a turn if you've already taken your weight off the inside of the turn. Okay. Good stuff. Right. We'll, uh, we're going to break this down into little small bite-sized pieces for you. We're not going to ask you to hang yourselves off the motorcycle your first run through, but eventually we will. And we're going to set up a couple different courses for you, some easy runs and some more difficult runs for those of you that want additional challenge so that you can try your hand at turning these motorcycles as tight as you can. When we're finished with the day, we're gonna offer up some informal instruction on turning drills. Lance is the master at turning. So we can put any of you that are interested in a little extracurricular activity into some turning drills so that you can um, become more proficient at it. Does that sound good? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions before we continue? Yes, sir. 
How does mountain biking relate to riding motorcycle off-road? There are certainly similarities. The major difference, of course, is weight. And as a result of that, um, it's much easier to make much bigger mistakes on a mountain bike and recover mm -hmm. than it is on these. So it, it's for us, the typical analogy is riding a dirt bike versus an adventure touring motorcycle. I consider an adventure touring bike typically to be a 650cc or above. Um, and um, dual sport or dirt bikes to be below. Um, and the, the main difference, of course, is weight. So if you do put your weight to the inside by accident on a small bike and the bike starts to tip, you can typically recover it. Where on a bigger bike like this, you know, Lance has got 560 pounds plus, plus his 150 pound <coughs> frame. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, once that starts to go, um, as you might imagine, it's hard to recover on. So, um, so. There's a lot of other things that transfer over too. Like if you're going downhill, you know how on any, whether it's a motorcycle or a mountain bike, if you grab too much rear brake, all your all your weights on the front, it's easy to lock that up and you know what happens then. Oh, yeah. Then the back end starts to pass up the front end. Yep. So you know that it's the front brake going downhill. As much as as much as people fear locking up the front, you've got to you've got to get comfortable using that front brake when you're going downhill. Um, and um, I'm assuming um, on mountain bikes you, you counterbalance to a certain degree. You don't have the the weight of the of the bike to, you know, to counterbalance, but um, I'm assuming you're not wanting to get into the inside of the turn on, on loose ground as well. Good question. Yes, sir. New, new dual, dual sport rider with a nagging question that I can't get a clear cut answer on. What's the best way to get off of one of these things if you're going down, if you're going to lay it over? Do you stay on the bike? Do you step off? What's, what's yeah, the that's strategy? A, that's an excellent question. Um, typically what you're going to find is that you're much more likely to fall in the first place if you're using improper riding technique. Most of the time people fall when they're trying to turn the bike and they're typically falling because they're putting their weight in the wrong spot. Their weight is either centered on the bike or to the inside, which just creates a whole host of problems. Not only is the bike more likely to fall, but because your weight is on the inside of it, it has it's more likely to fall on you because you don't have enough time to shift your weight and get out from under it. Um, oh, go ahead. No, please. It's another reason to, to be on the balls of your feet instead of the arches. If you're on the arches, you're too committed. Your, your weight's too committed. If you're on the balls of your feet, it's nothing to step off. But um, what happens is people get too committed. They put too much of their weight on their, you know, on either foot. And if if something happens, they can't typically, like we talked about a minute ago, the bike will fall on top of, well, basically your leg. Because, I mean, you should be ready to step off on all, at, at all times. Because those, you know how those, those falls happen out of the blue and you should be kind of basically light on your feet. We, uh, the, the, the simple of, it's, it's hard to have a simple answer, but the, the reality is, is that once you learn the techniques and you apply them, first of all, you're probably not gonna fall anywhere near as often, if at all. And second of all, when you do, your weight is already in the right place to allow you to get off the bike. The biggest issue that we run into at Rawhide is people that commit themselves to the bike too much, as Lance said, getting on your arches. Um, and, uh, and I'm afraid this is more prevalent with women than men. Um, we, we, uh, we have an analogy at Rawhide um, that, uh, that men treat falling off a motorcycle, um, men and women as a relationship. When men feel the problem start, they, I'm out. <laughs> and women tend, not always, but they tend to follow it all the way down. I can save this. And we're going, get off, get off, it's going sideways. No, 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 I can do this. And, uh, and, and really that is, I mean, I don't, I don't um, and, and the reality is, is that that's exacerbated by the fact that women don't tend to ride the boxer twin motorcycles. These are a much better bike to fall because um, they have space for your legs. The valve covers are, um, are an engine block are sticking out far enough to where if the bike does fall, it creates kind of a, a spot for your leg to be. And the smaller bikes, the 650 singles and twins don't have that space. So it's more important for riders on smaller bikes to get away from them faster. Um, that being the case, um, out of 2,000 almost people that we've trained in this, we've never had anybody get hurt. I mean, bikes fall and we just go, oh wow, that wasn't a big deal, was it? No, it really wasn't. Okay, let's get up and keep going. Well, so. I launched mine off a of center stand this weekend. It was saved uh, by a cement pillar. So that's, <laughs> that's the only way I know how to do it. That's good. Behind me. good stuff. Yeah. Is, is there any other questions we can answer today? Yes, sir. What, what's the um, sort of class policy on getting your feet on the ground? Are we supposed to avoid it at all costs? Are we supposed to do it when we think it's necessary? We, um, the, I don't have an issue with getting your feet down. Okay. Um, 
the, the biggest issue that people run into with getting their feet down is when they, they have side cases on the bike. Because what tends to happen is if you're riding along with a hard side case and, and the bike starts to tip and you kick your foot out to catch it, which we do all the time, um, if your foot is too close to the motorcycle, then the, the forward movement will kick your foot back and into the side case. And it hurts. That's one of the reasons that we wear high-tech shoe boots like my tennis shoes that you see here. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid my, my boots uh, suffered a catastrophic failure the other day, so Lance will be doing most of the riding. Um, but, uh, but a good set of boots protects you from that. What we have learned to do when we have to put our feet down is we've learned to kick our legs way out. So if the bike starts to tip and, and we need to dab our foot to keep it upright, we will reach our foot out so that if the ground kicks it back, it'll kick beyond the, the side case. I know it, it looks a little Cirque du Soleil, but it actually works pretty well. There's something Dell teaches. We, we, in our next step class, which is an advanced class. One of the things, we, we work in sand a lot, just because that's kind of everybody's nemesis. And one of the things that we go over is, we'll have people go through the sand, the sand pit that we have, and what he'll have them do is, is dabbing at, um, how would you say it, um, predictable steps. Mm -hmm. Basically what they're going through is they're dabbing, they're dabbing because the difference between um, shifting your weight over here and, and, and you know dabbing at the same time is totally different than when you're going over and you're trying to stop it when it's too late. Mm. So uh, what he did, what we work on is is kind of dabbing your way through the sand and then kind of extending those. For, you know what I mean? So you've already you've already made the decision whichever side you you know what I mean, to, it, which um, is different than trying to catch yourself on the bike it's like halfway over and it's basically it's too late. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so we, we're not against dabbing, it's just you want to kind of, if you want to work on that, is to, to make it um, something that you're consciously doing ahead of time. So. One more question. Do you guys uh, advise riding with the stock seats or lowered seats or what? That's really a matter of, there's, there's two things on a motorcycle that are just an incredible matter of personal preference. One is seat and the other is windscreen. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just don't, it's really what speaks to you. Um, we don't... Uh, um, we don't, we're not going to stand here and tell you that you have to have both feet firmly planted on the ground to ride off-road. Um, that is just not the case. And, and the reality is, is that you're cheating yourself by trying because you're going to find yourself in situations where even if your seat is 30 inches off the ground, it's, it's pretty low, you're going to be on a slope or something like that where you're not going to be able to put both feet down. What you need to remember more so than having a low seat is that there is no Velcro on your pants. You are able to move around on the bike. So if there's a situation, you know, you're looking ahead and going, okay, there's a down slinging le leaning left slope here i got to make sure i prepared you know to put your right foot down you know you're not trying to put your left foot down on the downhill slope or you're going to end up running away from your motorcycle we have a pretty cool video of that we can show you later <laughs> um excellent questions anybody else have any questions One more. Yes, the um if you do have a passenger and you're doing uh like easy fire roads nothing hard besides going slow what other advice can you give Lance likes to ride behind me a lot, so I'll let him answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. The, the, um, riding a motorcycle two up, um, the, the way to do it properly is to stand up together. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a very symbiotic endeavor. Um, typically, the, the right way... It takes some practice. It takes some practice. We actually teach couples trainings. Okay. And uh, you'll have your bull stand up. Um, the passenger will put their hands on your shoulders or on your sides. And uh, that way they can feel as your body's moving back and forth to compensate for movement of the motorcycle and then they're able to react. It's actually a lot of fun. It's a lot more work for the rider. Um, you can also do sit down um, two up riding when, when you're on a road like this yeah. and it's pretty simple, but you just have to know when to stand up. If you see trouble coming, you see aggressive terrain coming, then you need to know to stand up. But that being the case, we, we have two up ride, you know, the Continental Divide ride we do, which is nine days from Montana to New Mexico. Um, we do two up all the time. and. Uh, it's, uh, it's no, no problem. We, we actually offer a couple's tour. Um, the, one of the main differences is that we stay in hotels every night <laughs> instead of, because, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, sleeping in, a, sleeping in a tent's fun and riding's fun, but doing both is a couple, ugh. One of the things, and, and, and Sean was actually telling the truth about, we do ride two up a lot, like we'll have to ride somebody's bike out of a difficult situation, and then, you know, we got to go back and get it, so we're riding two up. And typically it's through really difficult terrain. And one of the things I found riding on the back is that if you're watching and you see something come up, it's easy for you to shift your weight to try to come. And that's the last thing 
the, the rider needs. The, the rider doesn't need anything unpredictable. So you're actually almost better off not knowing what's coming. Because it's, it's just human nature. You see something, and you're going to try to handle it the way that you would handle it if you were on the bike. And, and, and really, the rider doesn't need anything unpredictable from, from the person on the back. So. I was told to be a nice piece of luggage. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it, just human nature. And I, and I you, really, I just, I'm just as still as I can be. Yeah. yeah. And, and so. it's easier to do that if you don't know what's coming. If you see a rut yeah. coming or something, you, you naturally want to, I mean, because we all ride, so we're, we're all trying to handle the situation without even thinking about it. Yeah, when Lance and I are riding two up, I mean, as you might imagine, we're, we're not a petite couple on a bike. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I don't even know he's there, but I, I can have an 80 pound person on the back and it's like having a sack of potatoes back there moving around and... That's uh, why I got my eyes closed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've, uh, our, our techniques in off-road riding um, are constantly develop. In fact, literally every night after we have run a clinic, Lance and I sit down and talk, what went well, what needed improvement, and, and we improve upon uh, for every clinic. And that also applies to riding two up. The last time I had a guy that broke his bike and needed to ride, I, I had him climb on them behind me and I said, don't be afraid to hold on to me. This is, you need to, you need, don't feel like you gotta hold on on the back. You know, we're, I'm much more concerned with you being stable and secure. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you may take care of this in inspection, but are you gonna um, have us adjust tire pressure, the suspension adjustments? Very glad you brought that up. Um, we have no concern for suspension. Okay, um, even the that, ESAs? Yeah, in fact, if you have ESA, put it on single rider mode. I'd much rather you have all your feet on the ground than have height and clearance. We don't need it what we're doing today. Okay. You do need to turn off your ABS. You do need to lower your tire pressure. ABS and dirt do not get along, um, especially for the purposes of what we're teaching today. Um, tire pre high tire pressure on this kind of terrain makes it very, very slippery. This is a 25 pound day, 25 pounds in front and rear tire. Um, if you don't know how to turn off your ABS, let us know and we will show you. Ray? Do you have a rule of thumb for turning off the ABS? No. The rule of thumb is that it's incredibly complicated depending on the model of motorcycle. And I mean as far as when you would turn it off? Oh, um, pretty much any time that I want to slide the tires or do aggressive off-road braking that's coming off. Um, you, uh, f what we're going we're gonna to work on something today called a trail stop, um, where you're going to use your front brake to bring the motorcycle to a complete stop. <laughs> And uh, if you have ABS on it, it just won't stop. I mean, it'll, it'll take an extra 20 feet to stop. So if you run into terrain that's not hard packed asphalt, then I'm, I'm turning it off. Miss, you had a question? Um, I'll need to pump my tires back up. Is okay. there okay. some way to do What's it? What's your pressure at right now? Uh, uh, 32 and 36. Okay, yeah, um, when you drop your tire pressure, um, there's a couple ways to manage it. I'll start by telling you that riding at low pressure on the asphalt is not a big deal. We do it, uh, we ride a thousand miles at a time with 20 pounds on our tires. Okay. You just take it, just, you gotta take it easy on the thing. If it was hundred degrees out, I'd have a different opinion, but it doesn't matter in this kind of terrain. Just, you just take it easy. You're not riding really aggressively. And when you come to a gas station, you air them up. Okay. That's what I would do. Yes, sir. Well, I was gonna cover two things. One addresses your question. We have a compressor okay. up here Thanks. in our garage. So if you wanna air down, and we also have um, tire pressure gauges, so if you want right. to take your, your bike up Thanks. behind the garage, we can do that. And great. also, if anybody ends up being low on fuel, we have extra fuel. Great, thank you, sir. That's great. Yes, sir. How about riding on a, you know, a graded gravel road at speed is, is very different than low speed in mm -hmm. the dirt. And are you, are you going to review that, or what are your thoughts on? Because um, that, that, that can be problematic too, going around turns and yeah, the, there's, and it's different than a, than a dirt bike, I assume. It, it is. Um, and the reality is, is that there's a lot more that, that we would like to teach you than we can in such a short time. Um, the, the things that we will cover um, today are going to be entirely low speed. Um, we, we don't mind chatting with you about it, um, but uh, we, we also... You know, we're going to highlight the opportunity for you to come to California and train with us. And when you do, you will learn out high speed as well. In addition to sand and hill climbs and growing over logs and around trees and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, there's a soft sales pitch in here. The this counterbalancing is also is, is huge because when you get in trouble, it's going to be one in the turns. And we're going to work on setting up for turns ahead of time. Um, I mean, that's the biggest. Once you get the whole counterbalance, it's going to transform your off-road riding. Yeah, the, what you'll find quickly riding off-road is that the turning point starts a lot sooner than you think. You know, on the asphalt, you don't start putting yourself in a turning position until really you enter the turn. In, in our situation, you start turning, you put yourself in a turning position the minute you sight the turn. It could be 100 yards away. 
and you have already moved your body and twisted it into a turning position, the bike will ride in a straight line with your body set to the outside. And like Lance says, if, if you run into trouble in that turn, um, if you're going too fast, or if the turn gets really tight, a lot tighter than you thought it would be, you're already in a position to manage it. Good stuff, thank you. Yes, sir. As far as using the front brake, what percentages do you do front to back? I know it um, depends on circumstances, but in we're, general. We're gonna talk about that in detail, but the, the, um, the, the meat and potatoes of it is, is that your front brake is your most important brake, um, regardless of on-road or off-road. So anybody that has heard the rumor that you can't use your front brake in the dirt, that is just not true. Um, you, you gotta use your front brake. Now, how much of it you use and at what point you use it, and that just varies depending on the terrain. Um, what I use is the 30-30 rule. I, I try not to apply more than 30% of my front brake at a time. Mm -hmm. If I go from zero to 60% on my front brake, I'm probably gonna lock it up. If I go from zero to 30, that's usually enough to give it a good bite without locking it up and then another 30 and another 30 and you know until I'm able to stop the machine. Um, but that, that ratio varies depending on the terrain. Yep. You know, you're on grass like this and it's wet, it's gonna be a lot more likely to, this, this grass is gonna be easier to slip on right now than it would be an hour from now. So you're really just feeling it out. And you're gonna know when the, bike, the front tire locks up, it's not a death sentence when the front tire locks up. You just release it and reapply it, no big deal. So that's kind of a long, complicated answer to a short and simple question. No, that's fine, I, I use the front brake quite a bit. Yeah, it's good. So, Is there sorry. any problem with the proportional braking that some of these models have? Yes, if you're trying to do a stoppy, it's really hard. A what? You go up on your front tire, you know? Oh. You know, I'm sure you do that at Starbucks. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't go. To, I don't drink coffee. Oh, God, <laughs> I do it elsewhere. Okay. <laughs> um, um, what? Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's referring to the partial integral braking system on 1200s. Um, what that refers to is um, when you grab the front brake, you also get a little bit of rear, um, but rear is just rear. So if you grab the rear, you're just getting the rear brake. That is a standard feature on all ABS equipped 1200 GSs and most 1150s. Even with it turned off, Even with it turned off it's still integral, and there's just really no reason why they shouldn't be. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that BMW, their combination of braking and suspension is the best on the market. I mean, you just cannot, you cannot brake with a conventional motorcycle as well as you can on a BMW. I mean, I've ridden, you know, pouring rain, deer runs out in front of me and I stomp on the front brake and I panic and I stop so fast, like I almost can't get my feet down in time to keep the bike up. I mean, it's amazing. It's good stuff. So you have fine motorcycles. Anyway, any other questions? There's gonna be lots of opportunities to ask questions, just so you know. Um, we'll, uh, throughout the day, we're, we're here for that stuff. What we're gonna have you do is, um, we're gonna conduct our inspections right here on this road. So we're gonna have you line up your motorcycles. Um, we're gonna have a table set up here, and we're gonna have you pull up on either side of them so that we can conduct inspections. I have a 34 inch the same way. So you're, uh, they're stock. Oh, really? Yeah. And How's it going? All right, cool. What kind of toolkit you got there? This, so if you don't mind holding them for a second. The higher you go, the drop on your tank. You're going to have to replace these cables. The other thing is... is to go as slow as you can go all the way around the course. We're gonna have you go through twice. 
The first time is simply to go slow and get comfortable with the idea. For the last thing you'll hear me do is I'll come up to you if I see you're getting really tense and I'm gonna remind you to relax. I'm gonna remind you to hold on from the waist down. I'll say bite the seat with the inside of your knees, relax, keep your arms limber at all times. Would you like to see a demonstration? Yes. Cool. Let's see it, Lance. He's gonna to come toward us. I know you're not riding in this direction, but I, we just want you to see the form. This is what we're gonna be looking for, okay? So as Lance comes toward me, notice he's standing, he's looking ahead, and he's relaxed. See how slow he's going? He's see how, fall. See how the, the handlebars are moving a little bit here and there? He's fighting his balance at all times. That's what we want. When you're fighting your balance, you're learning your balance. We want to see you kick the, the handlebars around like that. Notice there's not a ton of throttle. We don't hear him winding it up and then dumping the clutch. We don't want that. This is what I'm looking for. Down up. Good. Relax. <laughs> slow down, slow down. There you go. That's better. That's the only thing I don't like about the fucking bike. Uh, the first gear. Really? If it just could change the first gear, it would be a perfect bike. You're using a little more throttle than I'd like. I'd like to see you use a little less throttle, a little more clutch. There you go. That's better. Keep your eyes up. Relax. There you go. Good. 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 Good speed. See how you're kicking the handlebars around? That's what I want. A little slower. Remember, don't pass me. There you go. Good control. Good. Good sighting. Nice and relaxed. Just like that. Well done. That's fine, you're doing just fine. Well done. Well. <laughs> good, Paul, good. Good. Relax your arms a bit, my friend. Cut that speed down just a little bit. There you go. See how you're moving the bars now? That's what I want. Just like that. Well done, nice control. Good. Just like that, all the way around, my friend. <laughs> Keep those eyes up. There you go. Good speed. Tiny bit slower. There you go. See how you're moving the bars now? That's what I want. <laughs> Smooth out that clutch. <laughs> yep. Hey, it's your first run through. <laughs> nice. Nice. Good. Kind of hard to relax, I know. Good, well done. <laughs> Little bit less speed if you can manage it. There you go, good, good, good. Crouch down a little bit more if you need to get the weight off your hands. Nicely done, Tim. Well done. Good control. Good, I wouldn't change a thing. Well done. Good. Good. Nice. Tiny bit slower. Try not to pass me. There you go, good. See how you have to move the bars like that? Yeah. That's what I want. I want you moving the bars, good. Good, excellent control, well done. Just like that, all the way around. Good. 
Very good. Good. Relax. There you go. Nice control. Good. Well done. Just like that all the way around, all right? Well done. Try not to pass me, Ted. There you go. Nice. Nice control. <laughs> Good. Eyes up. A lot of tension building up here, my friend. Relax. Fight the bike with your legs so you can relax your arms, okay? There you go. Good. Much better. Try not to pass me. Nice. Good. Very good. Well done. Perfect. <laughs> good speed. Just like that all the way around, okay? okay. Without the foot down thing. Okay. <laughs> Time's up. Slow way down, way down. There you go. A little less. <laughs> I wasn't clutching. Maybe less. <laughs> I think my clutch needs an adjustment. You know, the 1200 GS has a nice clutch on it. Good, Pete. Remember, don't pass me. There you go. A little bit slower. You're about to pass me. Slow it down a little bit. There you go. See how you're having to move the handlebars? That's what I want. Tiny bit slower. Just shave a mile an hour off that for me. There you go. Good. It was perfect. It was perfect. That's fine. You can't tell me I'm doing good. You're doing fine. Okay. Just need a little bit more blip off. What's happening is you're letting off the clutch to give yourself some power, uh -huh. but you're not letting off enough. Okay. So you need to give it a little more power so you can straighten yourself back out. Okay. okay? Good! Perfect! Eyes up! There you go. Eyes up! There you go. Keep those eyes up. Your eyes keep going down, my friend. What's right. so fascinating down there, I wonder? I don't know. <laughs> Slow it down, my friend. Cut that speed in half. There you go. Whoa! Where's that clutch? My friend, way down. Cut that speed in half. Way down, way down. There you go. That's better. Remember, don't pass me. Try not to pass me. Good. Much better. I'd like to see you shave another mile an hour off that, okay? Yep. Well, as soon as you feel like you've got enough momentum to stand up, make sure you're looking up when you stand up. Okay. Keep those 
those eyes up. <laughs> there you go. Take your time. There you go. Good. Much better. <laughs> Slow down. Way down. Way down. Way down. Good. Try not to pass me, okay? Cut that speed down. You're going to pass me. Pull in your clutch. <laughs> What's happening is, is you're really just kind of riding at idle, okay. which is fine. It's just a little too fast. What you want to do is pull in your clutch, let the bike start to coast down until it almost stops, and then ease out of your clutch to give you some power. Right. Once you've got the power, then pull in your clutch, let it calm down a little, okay? Right. Let's try it again. Good, now pull in your clutch. Good, now ease it out. There you go. You got a lot of pressure on your upper body, relax. Excellent. Look up, relax. Good. You realize I'm going to make this really hard on you in the next round, right? <laughs> way down, way down, way down. There you go. Good, good. You've got a lot of pressure in your upper body. Relax your shoulders. Watch your clutch. It's starting to choke. Cut that speed in half for me, Rebecca. A little too fast. Good speed, Jeff. Cut it down a little bit. I think there's some bar risers in your future. Wow, well, there's some on here. There's, a, there's bar backs, I see. All right, strong, 130. Cut that speed down, Ray. Slow it down, buddy. There you go. Keep those eyes up. Good, good. There you go. Nice speed, Ray. You realize I'm going to get you on the next round, right? I just wanted you to know. I'm, 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 I was prepared for that. Good job, buddy. All right, round two. The idea. The second time will be to not get distracted. The second time you go through, I'm going to try to get in your face. I'm going to wave my hands at you. I'm going to do things to make you try to put your feet down. Okay? Would you like to see a demonstration? <laughs> oh. Nicely done, Paul. The brother says you're taking your chance. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Nicely done, buddy. Nice save, well done. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Just let those RPMs drop a little too much. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> ah, I haven't touched you yet. <laughs>
nicely done, Amy. <laughs> that brother telling you to run me over? <laughs> oh, nice save. <laughs> Try it again. Nicely done. Oh, save it. Save it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> Nicely done, buddy. <laughs> well done. Nicely done, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Let that clutch shift just a little too much. Oh, Good ride, man. Yeah, oh, see what's going on here? Yeah. When he's, he's doing this, where are you going to be looking? Above him? Yep. Yeah. How about when he's right here? Same thing. Just fall down. Yeah. <laughs> nice dip. Save it, save it, save it, save it! Save it, save it, save it! <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. I didn't even judge you. <laughs> Hey Pete, how you doing buddy? Hey, what's happening? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Watch that throttle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lance, tell you to run me over. moving there. Whoa, where'd you go? 
Where's that clutch at? That throttle, buddy. Yeah, a little hard on the throttle. Nice. Watch that throttle. That's still too high, buddy. That's right. Don't look at me. I'm not here. Nice control, well done. Keep your eyes on your focus point when you're doing that. Okay. All right, you're good to go. All right, thanks. All right. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> nice save, Rebecca, well done. Nice, nice save. <laughs> Nicely done. Been waiting for you, Ray. Nicely done. Nicely done, buddy. How we doing? Great. Feeling good? Yeah. Get a little more comfortable on the bike? You all did a great job. That was a great, great work. Um, we're gonna start building on that now. The next thing we wanna work on is what's called a trail stop. Does anybody know what a trail stop is? Stopping on a trail. Stopping and starting. Yeah, stopping and going. Good, actually, it's not far off at all. Um, let's say, for example, that we were riding up a hill climb. And the hill's reasonably steep, but, but you know you can make it, you'll be fine. And you're riding up, and something you don't know about this hill climb is what happens to the trail at the top. Does it go left or right or straight or does it stop? Is there a, does it, you know, a steep drop off on the other side? Is there somebody parked up there? You don't know, you've never been there before. So going flying over the top of that hill, guns a blazing is probably not a good call. In a trail stop situation, you'd bring yourself to the top of the hill, stop your motorcycle, take a quick look around, do a situational assessment, then continue riding, all without putting your feet down. To do a trail stop properly requires a few techniques. The first three, you need to know how to stand up, look where you want to go, and relax. That sound familiar? That's right. The next thing is, uh, <laughs> the next part is you need to um, have a little more speed. To do a trail stop properly requires you to have good balance on the motorcycle. And you notice that when we're riding really slow, you're constantly fighting your balance. You can't do that in a trail stop situation. You have to have a little bit more speed so that you can um, balance the bike a little better. Um, <clears throat> you also need to learn how to use your front brake. When we do trail stops today, we're gonna have you use trail stops using the front brake only, not the rear brake. This helps to put the bed, once again, the rumor that you can't use your front brake in the dirt. That is not true. Just be easy on the thing, don't stomp on it. You may hear me things say things like, a little more definitive on the brakes. 
Basically, that means I want you to be brake more aggressively. But I don't say brake more aggressively because when I say that, people stomp on their brakes. And I don't want that. I just want you to have a little bit more of a grip on it. We're also going to work quite a bit on body posture. And we're going to show you that in a little bit. More speed. Good. All right, Paul, use it down. Whoa, where's that clutch at? <laughs> good speed, good. All right, ease it down. Oh, a little too hard on that front brake, buddy. A little too hard. A little too hard. Good. I want a little more front brake, okay? Good. Good. I want a little more front brake next time, okay? More speed and more front brake. Ease it down. Nice control. Well done. Well done. One more. Give me one more. Yeah, there you go. Ease it down. Nicely done, Tim. Yeah, keep those eyes up. Good. Ease it down. Nice control. Good. Full stop. Okay, full stop. A little more speed. More speed. There you go. Ease it down. Nice control, well done. More speed, more speed, there you go. Sit down, good. A little more speed before the break, okay? There you go, Trev, right there, buddy. A little more speed. Ease it down. Nice, Eric, good. Give me a full stop next time. Ideally, you don't want to stop going up hill. You want to stop. The reason we're stopping is because you can't see what's on the other side. So you want to stop at the top before you drop down the other side. That's what this drill is all about. Rest assured, you're going to learn that in California. Nice, Dad. Nicely done. Good. Good speed, Pete. Good braking. Give me a full stop next time, okay? Oh, nicely done. Nice save. Good, Glenn. Get your weight forward as you go, okay? Nice, Dan. Now slide your weight forward to go. Forward, forward, forward. Nice! Just got that foot on the ground is all. <laughs> Try to make it none and you'll be having nailed. <laughs> Just need a little more speed out of you next time. What happened was you have good braking, but the speed wasn't enough, so it kind of lurched you to a halt. Okay. Good. Nice, Paul. Very nice. Nice control. Good. Good. Right, ease it down. Nice, Paul. Good speed, good speed. Ease it down. Good, full stop if you can, okay? All right, Jeff, give me some brakes. Good. All right, Ray, bring it down. I want to see you shift your weight back. Back to break. We're going to go get some lunch now, okay? I talked to some of you about it. Um, when you're practicing your, um, your trail stops by yourself, just practice slowing down and almost stopping. Don't come to a complete stop and go, because what happens is that little bit of time in, this, in the middle, everybody fears that and they kind of skip over all the steps to doing it correctly. So if you, take, if you take that out of it and just practice almost stopping, going, you're practicing the exact same steps and what'll happen is eventually you do a complete stop and you go, wow, I did it without even trying. Some of you have heard me talking earlier about uh, it's demoralizing to pick up your bike three or four times in a row. I mean, if you're if you're doing really difficult terrain where you're in, you know you're in over your head. The last thing you want to do is waste energy picking up the bike incorrectly. And ideally, you'll have somebody help you pick up the bike. So the first thing you do when you when you drop your bike, make sure you're okay. But the first thing you want to do is shut it off. They're not designed to run on their side. It only takes a few seconds to damage the cylinder with it running. It'll run out of oil. You want to make sure you shut it off as quickly as possible. Um, the second thing is just make before you pick it up. We all tend to get in a hurry to pick up our bike before anybody sees it. Make sure you're okay. Um, just take a second, take a breath. The other thing I forgot to mention is to make sure you have it in gear. 
Typically it's in gear when you fall because you're riding it. But if it's not, as soon as you start lifting, it's gonna, right. it's gonna roll, okay? Um, this bike is laying in a good position because the tires are on the downhill slope. There's not that much slope here, but even that little bit of slope makes a big difference. If the bike was laying on this side, what I'd wanna do is turn it around to where the tires were facing downhill. An easy way to do that on, on a 1200, you've got the cylinder sticking out, you've got engine guards on it, so you can you can pivot the whole bike on the engine guards. I'm not gonna do it on this bike because ideally I would have the Adventure Designs bar on here that would give me something to pivot. If I try to pull the bike, it's gonna be right on the valve cover. So you wanna make sure you have the right protection on your bike. You can just grab it in the back, you can just pivot it around on, on the engine bars and pivot it. If you, were, if you were climbing a hill and your bike fell on a hill, you, you want to pivot it around to where when you lift it up, ideally what you would do is pivot it to where it was crossways to the hill and laying uphill. And then when you lifted it up, you, I mean, you, you could ideally get on the bike with it laying towards the hill. The big thing you want to avoid is dropping the bike down the hill. All right. All right. So there's two ways to pick it up, and I'm also going to show you how to help help a friend pick up the bike. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, using this method. Is these are going to be my two handholds right here. I'm going to use I'm going to use the um, this bar back here and the bar up here. I'm not going to grab anything that's going to break off. And I'm just going to sit on the bike. Um, if the bike happened to be it's laying uphill, so it doesn't want to lay that way, but if it's laying all the way over, you want to get it up on the tires before. You want to get it as lifted up as, as much as you can before you go to lift. All right, so what I'm going to do here is find the right position. The big thing here is making sure that your legs are in the right position. You want to have a good 90 degree angle here. Having your feet just an inch or two off will um, greatly reduce the strength that you have for lifting the bike. Either way, if you've got them too far under you or too far out, the other thing is if you don't want to slip when you go to lift the bikes. You want to make sure you got good footing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself in position. I'm going to make sure I'm looking up before I lift. And I'm going to walk the bike up with my feet. But before, I'm not going to just go ahead and lift the bike because I might find that I'm in the wrong position, that I have my feet in the wrong position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bit of a test lift. And if I think it's good, I'm going to go ahead and lift it all the way up. If I go to lift and I realize I'm just not in the right position, I'm not going to try to lift it the hard way. Okay? So, I'm going to get in position. I'm going to look up. And see how I walked it up with my feet? Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep the bike leaning against me the whole time and reach out and put the side stand down. So if this bike was, was it, had fallen the other way, the first thing I would do when it was on the ground just reach over and put the side stand down. Because I don't want to be, I don't want to be lifting the bike and trying to turn around and put the side stand down. So if it falls the other way, the first thing you do is put the side stand down. All right? Ready? You okay? Yep. I'm ready to <laughs> go. One, okay. two, three. <laughs> See how much weight I was able to yeah. take off of that bike yeah. for her? Um, and if you've got gear on the back, it makes a world of difference. The other thing is if you've got 100 pounds of gear on, mm -hmm. Just take, um, just take it off. Because it's so easy to struggle and struggle and then halfway through the day you're going, I'm done. I don't want to ride anymore. Cause, so you want to make it as easy as, as possible for yourself. Um, I think I mentioned earlier to some of you that in our advanced class, the first rule is nobody's allowed to pick up their own bike. And that's because what happens is when you're doing really technical stuff all day, your, your energy level is dropping quick enough as it is. And just picking up your bike three or four times is enough, I mean, to where you're going, okay, I'm done for the day. So we have everybody get help to pick up their bike. And the first couple times people drop their bike, they're all, I can do it myself. But after the third or fourth time, they un kind of understand. And it's the same when you're out riding really technical or really, especially if you're trying to keep up with people that are way above your skill level. You want to get help. You don't want to, you don't want to waste any energy that you don't have to so, have. Your job is to make sure that we're working as a team, check that I'm ready, give me a count and make sure that you're looking up. Okay. Like <laughs> yeah. Okay, ready? Make One, sure you're looking up. Two, Look up. Three. Uh, and give a count of three. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Are you ready? <laughs>
I can help yeah, you from this side. When you're trying to do it yourself, make sure you don't try to lift if you realize that you're in, you're not set up correctly. It's just, like I said, just moving your feet a little bit or repositioning yourself a little bit makes a world of difference. Okay. I'm not gonna lift him, it's gonna be here for safety. up with her feet once she got in position now she used all her all legs to do that that's that was the correct way to do it good job good, good, you got go it. girl go So in this technique, I'm going to get in front of the bike, I'm going to cut my hands under the bar. And on this one, it's really important, again, not to grab anything that's going to break off. So what I'm going to do is put both hands underneath the bar, I'm going to crouch on my feet, and I'm going to look up. Alright? What we're going to do next is work on turning drills. Turning drills is learning to turn your feet around on the foot pegs. You need to be comfortable with the notion of getting your foot to twist around on the pegs and setting your weight on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to get everybody to ride down through the course. We're going to do another single file ride together. And as we're riding, I want you to focus on getting that foot up onto your toe, so your toes on the peg, twisting your toe so it's pointed as much into the bike as you can. 90 degrees is ideal. It doesn't have to be that far if you don't need it to. Come on over, folks. Um, we had you ride all the way around the course for two reasons. First is we wanted to get you comfortable with the idea of shifting your weight onto the pegs, and the other is to give you a general layout of the course so you kind of know where we're riding at this point. Now Lance is going to give you a demonstration on turning technique. Now there's very few things that you have to remember to turn this motorcycle properly. Um, number one is setting up for your turn. So before the turn begins, you're getting your weight onto one peg, always the outside peg. We call it the point in the push. We're looking for you to point your feet towards the turn and push your knee into the seat. You'll find that your motorcycle is designed to allow you to push your knee into the seat. Now, what's gonna happen is, this, is we're gonna say, point your toes, you're not pointing your toes yet. And you're gonna go, yes I am. And in your mind, you've gone completely like this. But in reality, you've moved your foot a matter of millimeters. So <laughs> we're, if you hear us saying it's just because we're seeing it a little bit, but it's not happening yet. Or you're turning your inside foot all over the place, but the outside one, the one that's important, isn't happening yet. So. We're gonna be looking for you to set, your set up for your turn and, and be looking for your next turn. That's as simple as it is. So as Lance is riding through, you're gonna see long before he takes his first turn, he's set himself up and he's already looking at his next turn. He's not focusing on the turn he's going around right now. Because if you look here, what do you think is gonna happen? You're gonna run over, you're probably gonna fall over. We want you looking way ahead or way behind you, wherever your next turn is. So if you hear me saying, where's the next turn? Where's the next cone? That means I'm looking for you to look for the next cone and find it and lock into it. You know everything you need to know about the turn you're going around. You don't need to keep staring at it. Does that make sense? So if I'm gonna make a left turn, what I wanna do is set up before I get into the actual turning, I wanna be all set up as I'm approaching the cone. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take this foot, which is gonna be the one I put all my weight on, and turn it in. And then let's lean the bike over. And then I'm gonna lean the bike into the turn while pushing my weight to the outside. And you can see what's holding me up, right? I mean, I'm not, not hanging on the handlebars <laughs> to hold myself up. I'm using a little bit of my leg here, but as you can see, I don't, I don't even have to use that. What we're trying to really stress here is if you put your knee into the tank and you use that as a support, you can really do some, some really awesome things on this bike when it comes to turning. Nice! Yes! Beautiful! Look back at me! Here we go, just a little bit faster. Good posture. Switch it up. Look back over your shoulder for the next cone. There you go. Good!
Nice. Excellent. Switch it up. Good. Look back at me. Where's Sean? Good. That's okay. Everybody's got a preferred I'm turn. It. <laughs> You're definitely a left turn kind of girl. <laughs> you got it. Nice and wide. Nice, good start. Switch it up. Look back at me, where's Sean? Good, good. Excellent, switch it up. Start looking for your next cone, over your shoulder. There you go. Good cars, much better speed, good. Look back at me, good, good, much better. <laughs> 30 more times, I'll get it. Uh, you're getting it, man, you're doing a great job. Watch your speed. Whoa! <laughs> good, good. I want you to swivel that head around a little more. Look back at your next cone. Nice posture, good. Good, beautiful, good. Right Twist that foot and look over your shoulder. Yeah. Nice, nice posture, good. Shift your weight. Look back at Sean, right here, good. Stay on me, good, good. Good, now shift your weight and start looking for the next cone. Good, perfect! Good! <laughs> Had a great time. Uh, been riding on the street for 20 plus years. Pretty new to the dual sport field, so yeah, I learned a lot about cornering and riding slow, and it's okay to drop the bike, it's fun. Uh, had a great time. So, thank you. Good, Paul. Good start. Nice. Well done. Shift your weight. Look back at me. Where's Sean? Where's Sean? Look back at me. There you go. Stay on back me. Back at me. You gotta get those eyes up and looking around a little more, okay, Paul? Okay. Start looking for your next turn, buddy. What's that? There you go. There it is. Look at that cone. Good. All right, shift your weight and look back at Sean. Where's Sean? There you go. Stay on me. Stay on me. Good. Let me see that inside foot. Look back to the next cone. Look at that in. Good. Look way over your shoulder. There you go. Good, now look back at Sean, where am I at? Look for Sean, where's Sean? There you go, stay on me. Good. Oh, nice save. I don't have a weight like that, that was good. Look for the next cone, where's it at? There you go, good, good.
that's fine. Off you go. We'll try it on the next one. Okay. All right, Eric. Shift your weight. Look for Sean. Where's Sean? Stay on me. Good. Good start. Straighten up. All right, now shift your weight towards me. Don't forget to twist that toe. Good. Now look for your next cone. Good. Well done. Much better. Uh, it's a great class. It's uh, it's shown me what this bike can do. I'm not ready to do it all, but the bike is. So it's a, it's a great experience. Going out to California would be, I think, nightmarish. Um, lots awesome. of sweat, lots of fun, but yeah, it would be very taxing. It's good. Sean and Lance, um, you can tell they're brothers. They make it fun, so it's a it's a good experience. Good. All right, look back at me. Where's Sean? Where's Sean? Where am I at? Look over here. There you go. All right, shift your weight and start looking for your next cone, Pete. Look over your shoulder for your next cone. There you go. Good, good. Good, nice. great class. I can't uh, say enough about it. Um, I've been wanting to do the Rawhide Adventure for a long time and when BMW of Denver offered this, I jumped on it right away. And I would definitely do it again and highly recommend it to everybody. <laughs> Look back at Sean. Where's Sean? Look over here. There you go. Keep your eyes on me. Good. Nice. Good. Now shift your weight. I'm looking for the next cone. Work it out. There you go, Sean. You're good. Good. Well done. Nice, nice start, good. Now shift your weight. Good, Paul. Look back at Sean, look back at me, good. Stay on me, stay on me. Good, good, well done. Now shift your weight. Start looking for the next cone, my friend. Look over your shoulder. There you go. Perfect, lock on it. A little more speed, Paul. Good. Good. Look at the next cone. Good posture. Well done. Shake, shift your weight and look back at Sean. Look back at me. Good. Stay on me. Stay on me. Good. The bike will come. Take your time. Take your time. Good. 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 A little more speed. There you go. All right. Shift your weight and start looking for your next cone. Good posture. Good, good, well done. Right here. Right here. Good. Dan, look at me. Where's Sean? Look at, look for Sean. There you go. Good. All right, shift your weight.
Get those eyes up, eyes up. Hold on one second. Hold up. You know, if this bike were mine, I'd probably be riding it in second gear. Oh, would that be okay? I think that it's, yeah, I think it's just too, too slow. Try, try um, running it in second okay. and just keep just it, at the, put it just put it in right second now. and go. Yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> good, good, nice position. Look over your shoulder, find the next cone. Nice, nice setup, good, very nice. Shift your weight and look back at me. Where's Sean? Look over here. There you go, good, <laughs> nice. Shift your weight. Look back over at your next cone. Where's it at? There you go. Whoa, good, excellent. Um, I have been riding for about five and a half years, and I just uh, traded in my Harley for my uh, 1200 GS Adventure and I'm taking, that was in April and I wanted to take this class because we've done some dirt and it was, um, it was a lot of fun but we also recognized that we really didn't know how to do it really well and so we'd gone to the seminar about Rawhide at BMW of Denver and we're both really excited to have the clinic and learn how to turn in the dirt and how to ride better on our pegs and um, this was a great day and everyone is so positive and encouraging it's just it's really wonderful so it's been fabulous for me and helps me a great deal nice Jeff good Jeff, look back at Sean, look back at me. There you go, stay on me. Good, good. Shift your weight and start looking for your next cone. There you go, well done. Me. Nicely done, man. Well done. You've done this before, I see. <laughs> I'd like to see you twist those toes a little bit more. Good. Look back at me. Good. Good. All right, wait towards me and start looking over your shoulder for the next cone. Good, well done. Uh, I've been riding uh, this R1200 for about a year and a half. Uh, very limited dual sport background and came out today to learn some skills and did just that. Uh, plus got a lot of great information on uh, bike setup and uh, how to progress my riding from this point on. Can't wait to make it to California and be a part of the uh, Rawhide uh, training out there and a, and a trip to follow. So today was a very good day. Uh, incredibly well run. Uh, I would highly recommend it to any any uh, dual sport runner. Good, Ray, well done. I love it, man, well done. Ray, push that knee to the tank a little more. There you go, good, nice. So, 
rawhide training, excellent. Um, gave me a little taste of, uh, of what the school might be like. Would love the opportunity to get out there and ride a few days with those guys because uh, I obviously need a little more training. I only dropped the bike once um, late in the day, but uh, um, I'd like the opportunity to drop it a few more times, <laughs> learn a few more things. I uh, can recommend it to anybody that uh, has any inclination whatsoever. Nice. If there's anything I would, I would tell somebody that wants to get into adventure riding, that it's this. People think that in order to ride a motorcycle off-road, you need to have a lot of skill, a lot of physical prowess, a lot of experience, you gotta be tall. None of that's true. It's not to say it doesn't help, but people show up at our events all the time that have none of those things just to drive, to learn a little bit, and they do just fine. Um, if you wanna, wanna take a motorcycle off-road, Raw is the place to go. They'll, they'll teach you right, it's good stuff. Hey folks, the intro course was all about having lots of time to sweat yourself around. The advanced course, there's nowhere near as much time. You have to shift your weight a lot faster. Absolutely gorgeous day. Everybody had a great time, and all of us are very tired. Usually, not enjoying some time. Uh, Rawhead Adventures is located in Southern California in a little town called Castaic. Um, it's about an hour north of Los Angeles proper. It's in the Angeles National Forest. It's uh, when you come to Rawhide, um, you typically are coming very, very far away from anything that resembles civilization. We have a ranch out there, and uh, we have uh, warm beds and hot showers waiting for you, and Cordon Bleu chefs that cook every meal you eat. Um, so when you're there, you have a really, really cool experience. It's a lot of good food, good friends, good riding.